our session on managing the change to a hybrid workplace, uh, brought to you by the new Leading Change and Organization Development Certificate at American University. We're so glad to see so many of you joining us here today. It's a real testament, I think, to the importance of this topic and also the popularity of American University's key executive leadership program. So really excited that you're here with us today. Again, my name is Marisa Sanchez. Uh, I am a uh, consultant in organization development and change management. I've done consulting for, I hate to say it, almost 30 years. And I uh, am focusing on mostly federal government work right now. But early in my career, I spent the first 15 years of my career consulting uh, in the private sector, mostly financial industry, telecommunications, and some insurance companies. So I've got a good uh, uh, handle on both the private sector and the public sector. I'm doing lots of work in the federal government today, strategic planning, team development, uh, leap change leadership, all those fun topics. Um, I'm going to let Matt uh, Minahan introduce himself for a few minutes and then we'll uh, introduce our agenda. So Matt. Uh, thanks, Marisa. Uh, my role here is as, as a director of this uh, new uh, program, the Leading Change and Organization Development uh, Certificate Program. I've been on the faculty at AU for 10 or 12 years now and, and teaching for about 20 years. And I do some work uh, here at AU and at uh, I'm a guest lecturer in several uh, doctoral programs around the country, but uh, mostly I'm president of uh, our strategy and structure uh, consulting firm and have been since 1997. So I think we're coming up on our 25th anniversary, um, doing large scale, two, three, four year projects, having to do with organizational strategy, structure, uh, business process, et cetera. Uh, thanks very much for being here. Really excited about uh, about your being here and uh, what we have to offer. And uh, hopefully you'll be interested in joining us uh, for our um, uh, January start. Uh, what Marisa is going to do here is going to give you a sample of the kinds of things we're going to be working on and uh, a sample not only of what, but how it is we'll be working together uh, in this uh, Leading Change and OD certificate. Marisa? Thanks so much, Matt. All right, I'm going to, uh, there we go, advance my slides. So our agenda today, we want to introduce a few key concepts around change management and leading change. And as Matt said, we really in our program like to uh, focus on application. So while I introduce some of these concepts, we're really going to have some opportunities for all of you to have uh, some virtual discussion with each other. We'll be using the chat box primarily because we really want to hear about your experiences uh, and your insights as you're listening to these key concepts and, and how you are thinking about applying them in your own organizations as you help your, um, your uh, workforces adopt uh, a hybrid workplace. So we're going to talk about the difference between change and transition. Transition being sort of that internal psychological process that individuals go through when they're moving from a current state to a future state or something old to something new. So we're gonna talk about what the difference is there. We're going to talk about the change formula, which is a nice way of um, creating a compelling business case uh, for the change and um, thinking about ways to, um, to overcome resistance to change. And our third topic will be around uh, engagement strategies and how do we help uh, individuals get engaged in the change work themselves so they can work through the transition uh, and be more likely to adopt the changes that we're all uh, de designing. And then we're going to uh, do a little overview of the certificate program. So we uh, wanna give you a little taste as Matt said first about what some of the content might be and some of the conversations we might be having and then give you an opportunity to hear a little bit more about the overall topics of the, of the program and answer or ask and answer all of your questions about the program. So we'll do that towards the end. All right, so we wanna know who's on the call today. And of course, uh, we can't have you all uh, individually introduce yourselves. We have a lot of folks on the line. In, in the program itself, we do quite an in-depth introduction so people really um, get to know each other well and begin to learn from each other. But if you would, just in the, the chat box, if you would type, and we'll probably see your name in the chat box, but if you would type the organization you're with, or at least the industry, you know, government, consulting, healthcare, whatever it is, 
and your role. We'd really love to kind of see who's here today, but we also want everybody to see who's here today because in our conversations, hopefully you will be learning from each other uh, hearing from each other, uh, understanding what folks are thinking about the content and how you how you might apply it. So uh, looking to see who's here, seeing lots of um, federal government, awesome. USAID, I saw HUD, uh, MITRE, great. Um, USDA, NIH, awesome. Seeing a few more public health, workforce development trainer. State government, communication supervisor. All right, so lots of good, uh, and of course it doesn't surprise us, lots of folks from the government here in our DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Uh, we'll have a lot of folks uh, from various agencies, I'm sure in our, uh, in our cohort. Excellent, thank you for uh, sharing who you are and where you're coming from. I think it's also really interesting to note, and we like to talk about this in our program, that while it's a program around leading change and organization development, uh, people uh, coming from lots of different roles to really apply change and OD to their particular role. So you don't have to be an OD consultant. You don't have to be a change management practitioner. All of those are really great skills to embed into whatever your current role is, whether that is as a, uh, a leader, uh, director, analyst, whatever it is. So we'll be looking forward to talking about that to you in, in, our, in our program. So thank you for all, for all the input there. All right, so let's uh, get started. So when we talk about change management, Change management is really a, um, a set of activities that we use to help people move through what we call transitions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But transitions are really um, a psychological, internal psychological process that individuals go through um, to um, let go of the old or the current state and move to the future. Uh, and managing change is all around the activities that we use to help people move through those transitions. So let's talk a little bit more about what we mean by uh, change and transitions. So when we talk about change, we're really talking about, um, we think of it as external, right? So you are adopting some new technology or a new system, a new tool that you have to use at work. You may be um, adopting a new role or having to work in new ways, new processes, new policies, new ways of working. A new boss might be a change for you, a new office space, uh, might be a change. Personally, it may be a new house, a move, a new relationship, a new baby, um, lots of different changes, but those are all considered uh, external. Transition is this internal process that individuals go through, again, to let go of the old and adopt the new. And there are several different transition curves. I selected two here uh, to uh, just demonstrate a, a couple. Um, and the first one here is on the left-hand side, the nice curve, uh, sloping curve is really based on the uh, stages of grief. Uh, so when we uh, lose somebody, passes away, we go through stages of grief and we've adopted this, the organization development discipline has adopted these stages of grief to really um, apply to organizations because when we change uh, anything in an organization, many of us have to grieve a little bit what the old is uh, to adopt the new. So as an example, let's say uh, the change is new technology. We'll just take the first one on our list here, new, a new billing system, for example, that are going to implement in the, uh, in the organization. So at first people may be in denial. You, they, I'm sure you've heard this a lot. Oh, they're not going to ever implement a new system. They've been talking about that system for years. They've been talking about changing out, you know, how we're doing our, our work. Never going to happen. Totally, whatever, not going to happen. Denial. Anger might be, hold on a second. They're changing the system. Why? Our, our system is perfectly good. I'm not going to change how I'm doing things. I'm about to retire in five years. I don't want to learn anything new. You know, kind of an anger. Apathy may be, I don't care, whatever, I give up, change the system, we're gonna do whatever we're gonna do. You know, kind of just really apathetic view. Ambivalence is now, well, there are some negative things about our system that we probably could fix 
but I don't know if the new system is going to be all that great. I kind of have to wait and see. I'm kind of ambivalent about the two, but I am at least open to looking at what's happening. Acceptance might really look like, you know, this, this new system is definitely coming. Uh, it's going to be here. We're getting trained. And um, I think there might be some good things about it. Hope might look like this new building system is actually going to decrease my workload and I'm going to be able to be able to spend more time with customers on the phone. And that's pretty exciting to me. And enthusiasm might be, wow, we should have done this sooner. This system is really helping us be much more efficient. And I can really focus on more value add activities as opposed to wrestling with that system every single day. So kind of an enthusiasm there. So that's one curve. Uh, one thing to remember is people don't go through this curve sequentially. So they may start somewhere in the middle and move forward, or they may start somewhere and go backwards. Um, you know, when the system doesn't work, people go backwards. Uh, they're not going forward. So there's lots of variables to, to make people move uh, back and forth along this curve. Another uh, curve that I want to share with you is somewhat different is the curve on the right, which we um, call the honeymoon curve. It starts off much more positively. So uh, thinking about a honeymoon, uh, can't wait to spend the rest of my life with this person. That's the positive anticipation, right? This is going to be so great. Finally found the person that I want to spend my life with. Excitement. This is awesome. You know, we're, we're spending every day together. We're making plans for our future together. This is so exciting. I can't even imagine that this you know, this is my dream life. This is great. Then there's a little questioning. Well, you mean I don't get to decide what I want to eat for dinner every night myself or when I'm going to eat dinner or I have to coordinate my weekend plans. There's a little bit of, huh, a little bit of realism setting in. Sometimes there may even be loss. Um, I don't, I'm not going to be celebrating Thanksgiving with my family this, this, this year. You know, grandparents, my parents, my brother, my sister, they're all getting together. They're all going to be celebrating. I won't be there. I'll be with my partner's family. That's, I'm feeling sad about that. I'm, I'm feeling sad that I won't be with my own family. And then hopeful realism. You know, there's a give and take in this partnership, but I'm really finding, you know, real joy uh, in this relationship and, um, and in my life. So you see sort of the curve here. And again, we focus on more the organizational applications uh, of this curve where you might uh, find individuals in the organization very excited about a particular change. And then as things maybe become more realistic, um, a little bit more questioning and understanding that maybe it's not gonna be quite as rosy as, as we thought it was going to be. Now, the thing about these curves is that um, individuals are going through these transition curves all at their own pace. So as change practitioners, we really have to um, be thinking about where are various people on these curves as it relates to a particular change. Um, and we have to help people move through these transition curves regardless of where they are uh, on, uh, on a particular change. So it gets quite complicated to really be thinking about all the different movement that individuals, because this is really an individual process, how all the individuals are moving through these transition curves as you're introducing a change. So we want to talk about um, how this applies to our topic at hand, which is helping our workforces adopt a hybrid uh, work environment. So um, just if you would think through yourself four different um, uh, people or organizations on this curve. First, look at these two curves and plot where you might be on one of these two curves specifically related to adopting a hybrid workplace. Where do you find yourself kind of on one of these two curves? Secondly, think about your team or a team that you work with or support. Where might that team be on one of these two curves as it relates to adopting a hybrid workplace? Third, think about the leaders in your organization. These folks are not only going through the process themselves of adopting a hybrid workplace, but they have to support the change effort in moving to a hybrid workplace. So where might you plot your key leaders in your organization on one of these two curves? And then lastly, Thinking about your whole organization, again, all these individuals in the organization are in different parts of the curve. 
But if you think about the organization as a whole, where might you plot your organization on one of these two curves? Okay, so in your mind, you've now plotted yourself, your team, key leaders in your organization and your organization as a whole on one of these two curves. Now, I don't need to know where you plotted all of those folks on these two curves, but I do wanna uh, hear from you either live or in the chat, what, you, what insights you might have gathered just going through this process of mentally mapping these four stakeholder stakeholder groups onto these two curves and thinking about where they might be in their own internal transition processes. So use the chat box or raise your hand. And I think uh, someone on our team can uh, see who's raising their hand since I can't see everybody uh, uh, on the screen. And let's just see what you think about this process of mapping. Okay, so every stakeholder group is at a different stage, right? So you, even just with the four, you see it gets very complicated very quickly because all four were in a different place. Other, um, oh, a wide disconnect between staff and leadership, yes. So I often have to work with leaders. Leaders, if you think about it, if there's a new change happening, they've already sort of approved that change, right? They're the folks that said, we're moving to a new office space or they're uh, adopting a, a, new, uh, a new technology or tool or system or a new organization structure. So they've sort of gone through this transition themselves already. Uh, the people who, um, and so they're kind of off, off on another change already. We've got to really be thinking about everybody else who still has to move through that transition curve. So really good insight that leaders are often in different places from everybody else. Uh, let's see, I'm moving through here. Um, agree, we're all at different places. Um, leaders should be two steps ahead of their subordinates on the positive side. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. We do help leaders try to try to get there, uh, for sure. Let's see. Other interesting to know the time needed for the whole process, and people who are more entrenched in the organization are re reticent to adopt change. You have people who, I mean, I, when I started working uh, with federal government clients, I couldn't believe the number of people who told me, I'm retiring in five years, don't ask me to do anything different. And at the time I was, you know, in my twenties and I thought five years seems like a long time to me, but you know, not so much anymore. So yeah, people who are more entrenched, really very comfortable with their current state. Anybody want to um, open up uh, the microphones and say anything uh, aloud to folks or have a conversation about anything? Feel free to feel free to do that. Let's see, forced hybrid environment really broadened the views and understanding of how much work could really get done by teleworkers. Yeah, yeah. So wasn't it interesting? We did not go through any change management strategies when we all had to be working from home, right? It was just sort of we had to do it. Uh, very interesting change that takes place. Um, now we still had to, you know, help people work through it. There are people who really were having a hard time in the beginning. Um, we really had to be listening to people. We talked about making sure that there were still one-on-one -on -one conversations or still small teams getting together that you talked about how people were personally doing with the change, right? And personally doing with the whole pandemic and having either kids at home or, or uh, spouses and partners at home. So still lots of transitions that we had to help people with, but yes, the change happened uh, automatically, yeah. Okay, any other conversation here? All right, so this was introducing the idea of transition uh, and that, again, that internal psychological process that we all go through when we are faced with, uh, with a change. The next uh, concept that I wanna introduce is the idea of this change formula. How do we overcome resistance to change? Um, and this formula suggests, and I like to introduce it sort of right to left uh, because I really focus on the, on the resistance here. In order to overcome resistance to change, 
we have to have either very clear first concrete steps that people can take to move towards that future state. You know, it's very clear, I need to do these things and, and they're easy and I'll do them. And it, it kind of helps me move towards that future state, helps me to overcome some of that resistance of just making those first initial steps toward that future state. Uh, or, or we have a very compelling, inspiring vision. You know, people get really excited about what that future state might look like. And so that vision of what could be really pulls people forward and, um, and over the, the resistance. Or, or and, or uh, you need high dissatisfaction with the current state. So if people are really unhappy with how things are, they may or may not need a super compelling vision. They just wanna get out of that current state. They wanna experience it differently, whatever that looks like. Uh, so when we're thinking about change and creating um, kind of our, our case for change, trying, helping people overcome that resistance to change. We want to help people uh, really either amp up their levels of dissatisfaction and kind of, you know, really uh, internally get that they are dissatisfied with the current state, or we want to really help them understand what the future might look like or, or give them some very easy first steps to move forward. And we would do this as we're working with people to adopt a hybrid workplace. We want people to either uh, in order to overcome this resistance, have a really clear vision or have some really clear first steps that they can move forward towards. And if the resistance is low, then these other elements are not quite as important. If resistance is low, people may be focusing on other things. Other things are more important. So we just move forward with the change. We don't have to spend a lot of time on really helping people um, either feel excited about the future or feel very dissatisfied with the current state. So again, moving into, um, into chat, I'd love to hear um, from you as you're thinking about this change formula, how might you use this change formula as you're thinking about developing strategies to help your workforces adopt uh, a hybrid workplace? This is a, a change for them. It's going to be different. Many people have been at home now. It's a very different uh, change from what it might have been a couple of years ago when we everybody was at work and we're thinking, could we do hybrid? Now everybody's home, and how do we uh, help them move to a, a hybrid? So, what might be some of your um, thoughts here again in chat or in um, oops in chat or raise your hands uh, so we can have a little conversation. Thank you for adding the question, Lamont, to the chat. No problem, Marisa. Oh, okay. You have Dwayne who raised their hand. Um, do you mind if I unmute? Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Dwayne. Great to see you. Hi. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to bring this into conversation because people have made the shift and the change, and now they put it a life in a certain space. And now we're talking about going back and having this hybrid place. And now they're having to deal with the change of figuring out how they're going to do that how they're going to work that out, especially single parents who had to navigate families and things of this nature, or just families in general with children who are still in middle school and, and those type of ages. Because now I have a um, person who's really having a struggle with going back to uh, work because they've made their life where the balance is in making sure that the kids are okay. So I think there's a lot more now of resistance to even go back to hybrid at a high level, it has to be very minimal, in my opinion. So I wanted to bring that to the conversation. Yeah, no, great point, Dwayne. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is the problem, right? We we were working one way a couple of years ago, and now we're working in a completely different way. And you and you're right. We have fit our lives to work in this new way, and now we may be asked to go back or do something different. So it uh, if to I could us, add one more thing, uh, yeah. the other thing is. Um, not only are we going back or we're trying to figure that out, but we're also looking at all the systems that are showing us that maybe we don't even need to be in those uh, shared and shared environments because we can get the work done. People were more productive. There was a lot of pro productivity that went up as a result of people having to be able to focus. And that, that's another um, byproduct of this hybrid workforce. Right. Yeah, so people who are happy with the way things are, their level of dissatisfaction is very low. So to overcome resistance, we would really need to uh, create a very compelling, inspiring vision of what that hybrid uh, workplace might look like. 
and and um, and make it amenable to people who um, who want to stay home for the majority of their time versus uh, coming back into the office. I think I, I saw another interesting uh, point on chat, which is what happens if these three elements are different for different parts of your organization. So leaders might be in one spot and staff in another in these three elements here, the satisfaction, vision, and um, first steps. And so again, the change formula really has to be customized to these different stakeholder groups, because you're right, the change formula will not be the same for everyone in the organization. So we may need to, and this is where we'll talk about engagement strategies, but how we communicate about the change, how we involve people in uh, thinking about what the change might look like may be very different from in different parts of the organization, particular leaders versus staff. But you know, even um, different functions might think very differently about, um, about the change. And so that change for formula is very much something that needs to be thought through and customized for each group um, that might have a different pers perspective around the change. Um, yeah, so another comment here is that the um, change is forced on them. So we're gonna talk about some change engagement strategies because we know that when change is forced on people, what often happens is they may look like they're complying, but down the road, they're not really complying. You didn't really help them adopt uh, a, a new way of working or a new way of thinking because they never bought into it in the beginning. They were, they were not part of the process and they felt it was forced on them. So that we'll talk about that when we talk about change strategies. Yep. Yeah, employees feel like we're taking a benefit away from them by asking them to come back. Exactly. Matt, you had a question out here. Do you wanna address that? Sure, I think it's, uh, it's gonna be a challenge for organizations to decide uh, what is the work we can do virtually best and what's the work that requires us to be there? And I think in thinking that through, organizations are gonna need to make some judgments. And as I think you said earlier, uh, Marisa, this is gonna be really different function to function. You may be able to have the IT uh, department work in one pattern and the, uh, the finance function work in another uh, structure. Uh, and so creating a company-wide a uh, unified set of policies is gonna be really tough. And uh, I think facilitating that conversation and helping organizations differentiate between the kind of work that needs physical presence and the kind of work that can be done distributed is gonna be a, a big challenge. Mm -hmm. So as you all are thinking about this change formula, are there some insights that you have about how you might position this change to different parts of your organizations? Uh, as Matt said, different functions or different um, levels in the organization will respond differently, but how might you use these elements of the change formula to, um, to direct your, your communications and your engagement with different parts of the organization? Any thoughts on that? And again, happy to have folks raise their hand uh, or um, type in the chat. Dwayne, are you raising your hand or was that? I am. Uh, okay, yeah, good. I, I do Thanks. have a thought. <laughs> yeah. And I'm in training and development. And so one of the things that I get to do is actually, you know, uh, talk about these type of competencies at a lower level with the foundational leadership program of uh, USDA, but um, this idea of resistance, a lot of times people might think it's resistance, but they need more information. Sometimes people might think it's resistance to the change, but it's not so much. I would like to know if, you know, and in, in, in my way of making sure that we take this formula and actually put it into uh, practice, it would be really helping people understand what resistance really is and not what they just yeah. think it is. So I think by having this formula, really you know spell it out for them we can have a better uh more robust conversation around resistance when uh people uh are not ready to change yeah thanks Dwayne. there's there's a whole body of knowledge around resistance and the types of resistance and so yeah some people might resist just because they don't know enough you know they need more information they're not really sure how this is going to work 
what's going to be expected of them. They need more information. But actually, that's our biggest mistake that we often make is we just think we need to give people more information and then they'll say, oh, okay, I got it. And really what we need to do is help people through these transitions. Most people are resisting because of those transitions, the emotional uh, and psychological processes they're going through to let go of the old in order to adopt the new. So if we just give them more information, we're not really addressing the emotions. So I absolutely agree with you, uh, Dwayne, that we need to be giving them information so they understand. But oftentimes uh, what I see is we make the mistake of just giving information, 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 expecting that people will then say, okay, I got it, I'm, I'm on board. And yeah, that actually isn't with, addressing the, the issue. That, that happens a lot with us, you know, training. They say, okay, you need more information, so go to training. And it's not, you need more empathy and you need to lead with your heart and not just with your head. So that way you can, you know, talk to the whole person and maybe they might get on board. And I saw in the chat, someone's talking about the return to work and then the Delta variant, variant came. And there's a lot of resistance around that as well. So people saying, okay, what's my work environment going to look like? How am I going to, you know, wear a mask all day? You know, we had to do that with our children when we, we sent them back to school and they have to have a mask on all day. So what, what is that compounding along the way? For their health and all these kind of different other things so more information doesn't always satisfy it it's like okay so how do you help me with my humanness and mm -hmm. i think that's important yeah yeah great point i've got somebody in here who said managers in their organization are not clearly articulating the vision of what's possible through the hybrid model uh, and yes lots of different people different demographics are going to be thinking about this quite differently uh, I think I've I've noticed that more of the folks who've been around for a long time want to um, go back to work. That's sort of how they they're most comfortable with that, right? And and others are not. So um, good good point there. And you bring up another great point, Dwayne, which is change is constant. And so even though we're thinking about okay, now we're going to move to this hybrid work environment, maybe not because maybe Delta is going to force us to not move to the hybrid work environment. And so we're constantly looking at change in a very global context you know not global meaning you know worldwide but in the in its broadest systemic uh view what is this change and how are we thinking about this change because it's not just a one and done there's many many changes i think i see another hand up jason taylor hey how are you um another concept too that i, I look at when we talk about change is the differences between um, when, you, when you're dealing with employees um, that, and I hear this, uh, the sentiments in some of the conversation already, is the culture and the climate, right? So a lot of times, um, you know, in change, like as you mentioned, you have to take people through the process and a lot of the resistance coming um, from, uh, you know, the culture, right? Is that there's gonna be also a change in culture and people are just comfortable where they're at. But as leaders, we have to be able to express, express and explain the difference, right? Because there is a difference between the culture and the climate, right? And mm -hmm. oftentimes people think the climate may change and it might, right? If you do change wrong, the climate will change, right? But the culture um, expressing to them that what we're trying to go towards in this change is, um, 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 and speak to the cultural aspects of, of the change as well. Um, uh, you know, I know where I work at, uh, uh, one of the biggest things for me and some of my other colleagues for when we, when we work here is the environment, right? And we're in a change in our organization and even in my division areas. And one of the main things I keep hearing all the time, it's not gonna be the way it used to. And we used to have fun and we used to be able to come to work. It's all surrounded about culture. Mm -hmm. And they're fearful that they're going to lose that. They already feel that, like you said, in this hybrid environment, that this social aspects of it is already being missed. So um, it's a very tough conversation. And, and during those tough conversations, leaders need to, uh, that's where we step up and try to um, explain that and help them through this. Mm -hmm. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, the culture is a really interesting piece. What I've noticed in organizations that have made, um, that you know, do change well, is they anchor the change to 
their, their values and the culture that they hold dear. And so regardless of what those values are, if they can show that the change that they're adopting, uh, the values are not only retained, but maybe they're even strengthened. You know, so if your values are around collaboration, for example, and you used to have these fabulous collaborative workspaces in, in your physical environment, uh, you know, with electronic whiteboards that you're working on together and, and rooms where you can have mobile furniture and all, all that great stuff. And now you're all at home. Okay, but how do we then still capture the collaboration value that we have? What do we do? Do we you know, bring in collaboration software? Do we have meetings in a different way? But we still really anchor ourselves to the values and the culture that helps us with the change. So we're not changing who we are. We still want to be collaborative, but it's going to look different because of our environment. So I think that you bring up a great point um, that the culture is really something that we can use as a force for enabling the change and helping people move through the transition to feel like not everything is changing. I think it's really important when we talk about change in organizations to help people understand what's not changing because we're always hearing about what is changing, but here's what's not changing. Here's what we're not going to change, particularly if it's our culture or, or our values or who we believe we are. And, and that's, uh, I think, a, a, a real um, support in, in, in a helping folks adopt new ways of working. Uh, good conversation. Um, I want to bring up this other point that I see in chat. Um, somebody says their organization is looking to uh, automate processes. And while they're saying nobody's uh, work is going to be removed, eliminated, reduced, whatever the right words are, um, you know, they're still talking about uh, automation. And <laughs> what does that actually mean? And so words really make a difference here when we're talking about, uh, again, we'll talk about engagement strategies on the next slide, but what we communicate is so important and we have to communicate in a way that we um, are, are making ourselves heard by the people who are listening. We don't want to talk, you know, our language. We have to talk their language. People who are um, who are going to be impacted by the change. We want to be speaking in their language, and not this kind of double speak uh, that I think is being suggested here. Uh, it's happening in this organization. All right. Um, let's. Uh, oh, my chat just went all the way to the top. I need to get down to the bottom here. Okay, let's move on to the next slide then. I wanna introduce our third uh, topic around change management, which is uh, change management strategies. And these are really um, categories of change management strategies that we use, again, to help people move through those transitions. So again, organizations change when the individuals change, those individuals go through uh, those transitions. So engagement strategies, and somebody had mentioned this in the prior chat, engagement strategies are um, engaging people who will be most impacted by the change and engaging them to define the problem, you know, define what the current state is, potentially doing some current state analysis or really looking at what the problem is, as well as engaging people on what the solutions might be. So some examples of engagement strategies might be a working group five to eight person team, who's really gonna focus on a particular problem in the organization, uh, really do some analysis on, on what might be the, the causes behind that problem and uh, be thinking about what solutions uh, might, might uh, support, you know, removing, eliminating, reducing that problem. Uh, so working groups might be one, um, uh, in organization development, we do a lot of world cafes or appreciative inquiry, very large, uh, large scale, large group uh, techniques where we're bringing a lot of people together all at once and having them really focus for a specific period of time on defining the problem, you know, giving us their input on what they believe the current state looks like, and then their ideas for the future, their ideas for solutions. So engaging people we know People are more apt to adopt change when they're part of the process, when they are a part of understanding why we're changing and what that change might look like. You know, all the better, the more we can engage people. It takes longer, we know, but we get better results, better adoption, and we get better ideas and better solutions when we engage more people as well. There's that whole uh, factor around getting more minds around uh, engaged around the problem. 
The case for change is another set of, um, of uh, change management strategies, articulating the case for change in ways that really resonate with the people who are going to be impacted by the change. So again, uh, to the um, prior chat conversation about we're automating our processes, well, what's the case for change? If you're using the term automated and people mean think that means I'm being let go, that's not a great case for change. So articulating the case for change in ways that really resonate. Um, as I was thinking about this, what always pops into my mind when I think about the case for change, and this is decades ago, I'm sure many on this call won't even remember this, but uh, in Congress, there were uh, several Congress people who were advocating um, simplifying the federal tax code. And they brought onto the floor just wagons full of paper, and it was the tax code. Like literally just printed out the thousands of pages of tax code. And it said, this is the problem. This has got to be simplified. You know, regular people cannot understand this thing, and we shouldn't expect anybody to, to understand this. So it was a very visual case for change. It was um, a nice way of just really letting people see, wow, that's a lot of complexity there. Uh, a vision uh, and change strategies around vision is really uh, creating a compelling and inspiring picture of that future state. You know, what could be the possible? Um, again, going back to this uh, tax code um, example, a couple of years ago, I saw an article where somebody was suggesting that some percentage of citizens in the United States could uh, complete their tax reform with just a two-sided postcard. You know, I mean, what a great vision is that? gosh, it's only gonna take me that little bit of time to fill out the back and the front and I'm done. Uh, so what a great vision. So again, it could be that kind of a vision. It could be demonstrations, uh, role plays, uh, technology demo, a variety of things to really help people see what the future state might be. Communications are a whole other a set of change management strategies. And um, really there's a whole you know, specialty around change communications. Um, but they need to be two-way, a um, variety of forums to not only provide information, but to solicit feedback. We really want to have people be part of, the, of the, uh, the conversation, not just being talked to about the change. So large town hall meetings where you can do some really interactive things, um, you know, polling, uh, small groups online, whatever it is to really get people um, talking about the change. Um, small focus groups, social media, all those kinds of things are great communication strategies uh, to support people moving through the transitions. Resources and is, is another set of change management strategies. And here I really focus on um, the time and attention of leaders to devote to the change implementation. As we talked about earlier, leaders are often through the, the transition curve and they're on to the next change. And we really need them to stick with us and stick with the whole organization as all of us go through that transition, uh, those transition stages to adopt the new change. So, of course, we need, you know, uh, change project teams. That's one strategy of, of getting people involved and getting the right resources to build the future state, but also keeping those leaders engaged and communicating uh, is really helpful. And then lastly, Another set of change management strategies is just continuing to report against achievement of measures that we think show success. And I think here of sort of the traditional United Way thermometer, you know, where you see sort of the levels increasing until you get to your, your target funding level um, is certainly uh, something that I use or, or I often will use a dashboard, you know, like a you know, like almost your car dash or an, or an airplane cockpit or something where you've got three dials and you're showing progress against the three major measures that show success of your change. And those are really helpful to keep bringing out and showing people we're moving because change often takes time. A lot of these changes, I work on very large scale changes. They don't happen even in just a couple of months. Uh, so to really show people that progress is being made is, is a really important strategy to help them move through those transition curves. So a lot of information there about just categories of change management strategies. But again, I want to invite some conversation here as we go back to our uh, topic of helping um, the workforce adopt a hybrid workplace, whatever that might look like in your organization. After hearing about some of these change management strategies, what, what insights do you have? What change strategies might you think about using in your own organizations to help people move uh, to adopting a hybrid workplace? 
Would again love to see some uh, conversation in chat or um, raise your hand. Okay, so we have a question in chat. What is better, a firm deadline to start a formal hybrid workplace or floating the date depending on circumstances? Well, I think that because we're living in this world where change is sort of as out of our control, a firm deadline may not be that helpful. You know, like I had a firm deadline a couple months ago. Everybody was going to be in the office September 15th. Well, that went out the window because our environment changed. So if it's a, if it's a change that you think you can have some control over, then I think deadlines are helpful because it helps people um, prepare and everything that you're doing is working towards those, those milestones. Um, but I, I think for, for a hybrid workplace, it may or may not um, you know, be that applicable depending on you know, what we're seeing in terms of testing levels and all those kinds of things. Yeah, having a goal is good, but being flexible is also good. I think you know, we've, um, if nothing else, we've learned over the past couple of years that we need to be flexible even when we have a vision, even when we think we've got a, a future state we're working towards, it's got to remain flexible. We, we have to be able to live in some uncertainty and ambiguity and be comfortable with making decisions with just the information we have today, knowing that that information might change in the future. Great, other, other thoughts, other insights, other ideas um, that you might have about using some of these specific change management strategies. Jay, I see your hand up again. Yes, um, I, I look at case for change because just what you said and whoever chatted just recently, thank you for that. But it, I think case for change for me is key. I mean, they all key, but for me, case for management in this hybrid work environment, because again, um, you're tying it to, uh, you know, in ways that resonate, that, that impact to, to the stakeholders. So you have to explain this whole picture, right? And um, oftentimes what I see is that folks are jumping to, having a right answer, but not necessarily the right solution, right? Because we got to do something, but we don't make the case of why we're doing it, right? And what are those second, uh, second or third level impacts of that decision? Um, so the case of change is very clear because if you don't get that right, when you're articulating that to your folks, um, one thing you don't want them to get is change fatigue because they're going back and forth with the wind. Uh, you know, leadership needs to control that environment, that atmosphere, um, be intentional about what you're saying, but understand the environment and the atmosphere you're in so that you don't create a problem where there probably potentially wasn't over. Yeah, you, um, great point. We don't want to come up with a fabulous solution for the wrong problem. And we really want to understand the problem and understand why are we changing and then come up with a solution. Otherwise, you're right. Um, we tend to um, as a society kind of go to fix it quick. You know, what's the solution? And we, we often don't spend a lot of time thinking through what is the problem? What, what are the causes of that problem? The underlying causes, not just sort of the symptoms, but the underlying causes. Um, so yeah, thinking through that is really important. Marisa, a little earlier up in the chat uh, sequence, Carla Dancy Smith asked, uh, how do we do large scale events and do engagement virtually? that's challenging for us as practitioners to grow and change into. And I'm imagining there are lots of people on the call here who have confronted that themselves and have suggestions and ideas that, uh, that they can share in addition to, to your insights. Yeah, I would love to hear how folks are, are doing this. I, I know I've, um, I've joined several groups to just start to learn how to use some software that helps to engage lots and lots of people uh, in, um, in a facilitated kind of a session. So, um, you know, using Mural, for example, uh, using some other, uh, you know, I, I although I, it's not, a, I'm not a big fan, but even Google Docs is something that people are using now, but would love to really hear, get yeah, other ideas that people have for, for doing that. But there are lots of, lots of good groups that are just sort of um, serving as test beds and, and having people and training, you know, environments for people to start to learn how to use these tools because they're new to all of us. I, I, I don't know anybody who was really using them before uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, feel free to add um, 
tools or other large scale uh, facilitation techniques into the chat. Um, yeah, using new tools, polling. I also wanted to jump on uh, Dina's comment about agility needs to be part of the design. I, I am such a huge agile fan. Um, I really think that um, we need to be better at just starting some things and um, starting some changes with the mindset of we're testing, we're learning, and we're going to see how it works, and we're, then we're going to refine it as we go. We're just in a an atmosphere and an environment where change is just so constant that it's hard for us to say we're going to you know come up with a plan and spend months on a plan and then implement the plan. By the time we implement that plan, our changes might be completely different or, or have changed enough that the plan also needs to change. And then we're in constant planning. So I really love the idea of the agile, let's just get something done that's valuable uh, in a couple of weeks time. Let's test it. Let's get feedback. Um, let's scrap it if it's not working or let's build on it if it is. Um, so I think that's uh, agile is really, uh, I think it's a great way to be thinking about change. And quite frankly, the agile manifesto for those of you who are, who are really into agile and know that, I mean, it, it just really covers the change management set of principles. Uh, I just love it. So lots of good uh, synergy there. Uh, Dwayne, the government seems to take too long to embrace new technology while the world has moved. Yes, I have found that some of these great collaboration tools are just not able to be used uh, with various you know, firewalls and platforms in the government. Uh, I, I know um, lots of problems with MS Teams even uh, in federal government. We're really struggling. Uh, and they need to find, figure out how to do that. Agreed. Hey. Agile Manifesto, thank you, Lam. <laughs> Slack, yeah, that's another great, great tool that people were certainly using uh, before all of this, for sure, um, and using that more. That's a great one. Any other, any other input we'll, we'll see on chat. Uh, all right, any other thoughts on these change management strategies and how you might use them in your own organizations as you're helping workforces adopt a hybrid workplace. Any last thoughts around this topic? So those were our three topics. I really wanted to then just open it up to see if there were um, any questions about these particular topics. Again, um, maybe about the change principles themselves or applying that to the hybrid workplace or other ideas to share. Dwayne. Yeah, I was wondering, have you thought or how might we uh, take this information and turn it into some small, you know, micro learning opportunities to kind of create some um, engagement around this whole topic of change management? I know for me, I'm looking at how can I even make sure that low level GS, you know, nines and below actually understand what change management means in their realm and then how it impacts those that are in the higher levels of, of federal government. So I'm just curious, has anybody thought about like how could we take this big topic? Because I think it's a lot in just the, you know, the different areas that we anchored our conversation around to bring it into a micro learning environment or a just in time learning environment to help people really wrap themselves around the concepts that create change. Ma ma management under, you know, within the formula. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it is a big topic and this is really just a snapshot. Um, and I think there's a lot of thinking behind it. And you probably know more about this, Dwayne, than I do, but what I'm seeing in a lot of the learning and development um, arenas is really, you use the term micro learning, um, but, you know, creating like a, a one pager and then having everybody across the organization, or at least in a good chunk of the organization, read that one pager and have conversation in their teams about how might we apply this and have conversations across teams about how might we apply this. 
they're just snippets. And so part of me, you know, because this is my field, I feel like, wow, how can you boil like all of this stuff <laughs> down to a couple of one pagers, you know, like, right. you know, but I do think that there are, I, I think it is helpful for people to look at things like a change formula or to look at a transition curve and say, how, hey, how does that apply in our organization? How can we apply that? We don't need to know the whole body of, of the of change management and, and organization development and leadership development and all of those things that come together, um, but you can take it. And so I have seen some organizations really, but it's almost a corporate wide um, um, initiative or, or you know some large segment of the organizations that's going through that micro learning together. And then they begin to apply it because the one thing you don't want is for different parts of the organization to be doing, learning different things. And then they've got different language and they're, they're not able to really connect to each other. If everybody, for example, just saw one or two of these transition curves and everybody in your organization started talking about, well, what am I going through? What are you going through? And what's our team going through? I think that would be a really interesting conversation. It would help people just with a little bit of knowledge really have some good conversation and maybe come up with some solutions for helping uh, each other move through the transition. So I don't know, that's a great answer. I'm sure you know more about how to do this, but um, you know, I think it's, you, you don't wanna not give information and yet there's a lot of information to give as well. I see Dina's yeah, hand up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks Dwayne. Can we unmute Dina? Hi. Hi Dina. Hi. So yeah, the, um, uh, you know, kind of looping back to the question of uh, that agility, I think many of us are from large organizations and uh, we know that timelines can be, you know, impacted by the complexity, the, you know, the matrices that exist and so forth. Uh, will we also be discussing strategies about how to, you know, um, manage those uh, uh, timelines when you're working within such a large organization. You mean in the certificate program? Is that part of the set of topics? Yeah, is that going to be part of, I mean, are there going to be, um, you know, strategy discussions about uh, specific uh, scenarios? And I'm not just talking about large as far as, um, you know, uh, employee number, but uh, complex organizations where, uh, traditionally, um, change management may be obviously negatively impacted by the many people who have to be involved in decision making, the many levels of, um, you know, uh, communication and so forth. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, we will spend, and I'll let Matt go through some of the overview of the topics of the sessions, and you might see some things in there. But when we talk about change management, you know, we'll do a little bit on the change portfolio. And I think this is a really important concept where you're looking at all the changes that are happening across the organization and um, connecting them to one another so that people don't feel like they're being you know, changed a hundred different ways with a hundred different projects. Uh, and you're also connecting those projects to particular points in time. So people feel like there are sets of changes happening. So I think one of the topics that we will cover in our change management session uh, as part of the certificate program is thinking about change as a portfolio of changes. And the more changes we have in our organization, I think the more important this, this is um, because um, people quickly can become overcome with change fatigue when they feel like there are you know, 15, 20 changes coming their way but if you connect those 15 or 20 changes to really a couple of things, maybe going back to our earlier conversation about culture and values or around strategic goals, people feel like, yeah, it's 15 to 20 projects, but I see how they all fit together and how they're all working towards where we're going. So that will be something that we address uh, in, in the session on change. Now, I don't know if you have anything else you wanna add or if you want to just uh, defer till we talk about the topics in the session. No, I would just say that, uh, you know, the days of any organization having one change uh, underway are long gone. And so uh, so making sense of the changes uh, is an important role for the communications function. And uh, when you think about it as a portfolio, um, you have to figure out how does this change relate to that one and that one to the next one and that one to the previous one. And as you said, uh, Marisa, 
uh, the link to values, the link to culture, the link to uh, uh, environment, the link to business, whatever the link happens to be, uh, these do need to have one or two unifying themes uh, to help people uh, make sense of them, prioritize them, and keep them organized in their own heads. Mm -hmm. Great. Now take yourself off mute or or in the chat box if you're in a spot like with dogs and kids at home and don't want to take yourself off mute. The chat is. I, I, had a, I, had a, I had a question for both of you. So yes, in your in your change, first of all, thank you. Thank you for a very good presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, in the change formula where you talk about resistance, how um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about how do you know when you have overcome resistance? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think a few things, and this is part of the um, setting up your success measures and understanding what success will look like for you. You know, I had a client one time who said, success for me is when everybody's now talking about this. We might not have even adopted it yet, but everybody's talking about it and using the language. And that could indicate that we're no longer resistant. We're now just really looking to, to build the change, whatever that looks like. Um, so I think there is a number of ways of understanding how um, where you are on resistance. Another technique that I've used is, especially for very large scale change, is to do um, a very quick, a very brief, like five or six question poll. Um, you know, uh, do you think the organization's going in the right direction? Do you feel like you're getting enough information about the change? Do you feel like you have the tools and the um, the knowledge, skills, uh, mindsets to move forward on the change. So maybe just a couple of quick uh, uh, questions, and we would call them a pulse check. Um, but doing that quarterly, you know, across several hundred people, can help you understand how you're moving and if you're overcoming resistance. So things like like that kind of a, a very very quick survey. You don't want to over survey people, but if it's like a five question that they know they can answer very quickly. Um, can give you a lot of data, especially, again, across a large uh, number of people in the organization. So a couple of ideas there about you know, measuring uh, when you've overcome resistance. I, I would add two, two more to what Marisa has said. Uh, one is um, poll, uh, poll the management chain and ask people in their own departments uh, to report how to what are you hearing? What are you seeing? What are people saying about this? And the second has to do with performance metrics um, on you know, the basic three performance metrics, timeliness, quality, quantity. Um, uh, how are we doing against our goals as we transition through the change? And so um, uh, you, you, know, you, you would expect any change to have a decrease in some metrics uh, while you're in the middle of it, but uh, starting to see an increase uh, is typically a good sign of reduced resistance. Thank you very much. That's really, really helpful. Thank you. Good. Mm -hmm. Thanks sure. for the question, Stuart. Good one. Good. Other questions? Questions or comments? Any insights that people have also welcome? I think we've won. Okay, that. maybe that's, yeah, good. Well, as Matt said, we have a few more information sessions coming up. Um, we will be talking about different topics, not just change. So um, stay tuned. You might just want to uh, attend the information sessions uh, just to get that uh, content and have conversation with other, others about that. Again, um, in the chat are links to the certificate program. I think there's a link to the um, upcoming information session. And you will get, I think, a follow-up email as well with all this information. So thanks again, all, all for joining us. I'm excited to have met you all and have a conversation. And uh, good luck with your changes. Take care. Thanks and goodbye.